Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm afraid John asked uh, that we should say more jokes. I'm afraid I don't know any good jokes. Um, I do know a few bad ones. Um, a man walks into a bar, says, ouch. I would laugh, because there'll be more later where that's from. <laughs> anyway, uh, as John kindly pointed out, I do work for Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs. Um, that is the UK's tax man. That does tend to make me the least popular person at parties, uh, unless there's a serial killer or a politician present. Um, what I'm going to be looking at today um, is the role and ethics of internal communicators um, within Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs. Um, HMRC is about 73,000 staff spread out across the UK. Uh, within that, it has a community of about 200 um, communicators who list internal communications as part of their job description. Um, and I'm, of course, one of them. Um, these were just a couple of the responses I got um, when I asked some of those communicators um, whether or not they thought about ethics as part of their job. Um, the answer, generally, was a resounding no. Um, ethics is a topic that has been endlessly debated in the worlds of PR and journalism. Um, arguably, part of the profession's is drive to distance themselves from the spectres of spin and dishonesty. Um, but the debate about ethics and internal communications hasn't really begun. Uh, it's an area on which the academic literature has so far been pretty much silent. Um, I wanted to start to explore the topic um, through a small-scale work-based study. Um, but when I'm talking about ethics, what is it that I'm actually talking about? This is, of course, the very basic principles. Um, the key point, because there will be a test later, um, being that morals are held by the individual, while ethics are universal and transferable between groups. Uh, what I wanted to do was find out whether, as a group, communicators uh, in HMRC thought about ethics as part of their role. We've seen the answer to that one already. This tied, for me, tied into deeper questions about their place in the fu and function in the organisation. Uh, what is an internal communicator when we get right down to it? Um, a rather idolised description would see them as an honest broker. Um, who is semi-detached from all levels in order to be um, trusted um, at all sides. What I wanted to know was, for embedded communicators working for organisations, is being semi-detached possible? Uh, in reality, are communicators more aligned to either organisation or staff? And in that way, do they become advocates paid to represent the views of another? Um, I also wanted to explore the boundaries of their role. Uh, the types of work communicators should and shouldn't be engaged in uh, is another topic that hasn't really been discussed. An area of interest was persuasion, which is often seen as the antithesis of ethical communication. Were communicators persuading? Who were they persuading? And did they think it was ethical? Uh, lastly, I was interested to know how communicators were dealing with ethical dilemmas. There's a range of individual, individual decision-making frameworks and codes of conduct available, uh, most of them originate in the PR world and have been expanded to cover the work of communicators. I wanted to see if these were being used or whether um, communicators were utilising other tools to make their decisions. Um, so I conducted my research um, through in-depth interviews um, last year while also holding down the day job. That was difficult. Um, so if we look, uh, first of all, at the role and position of communicators. Um, during the interviews, the majority of communicators initially promoted themselves uh, as being neutral. They almost echoed the honest broker mentality and said that they were not really aligned to either organisation or staff. Um, but further questioning, where I shone a light in their eyes, um, found this to be a facade. Um, the reality was that they were more aligned to the organisation and its staff, and this was acknowledged by all of the participants. Um, they linked this to their own status of, of, as employees, they pragmatically saw the bias as part of their role and a big part of why they got paid to do it. Um, for the more junior participants, this bias turned to subservience. Uh, they saw themselves as functionaries, in the main not able to guide or influence messages or question the decisions of those above them, even when they may have had ethical concerns. This subservience could be seen to link back to their lack of consideration of ethics as a whole. They either thought it had been considered somewhere else thought their opinion didn't matter and wouldn't sway anything, or that it was just not their responsibility to think about it. Um, looking at the boundaries of the role and the type of work participants were engaged in, persuasion was a key part. 
All participants uh, unhesitatingly confirmed persuasion was part of their job and saw this as being inevitable and ethical. Perhaps unsurprisingly, given their own position in the organisation, the vast majority of their work was persuading staff on behalf of the organisation rather than the other way round. It was argued that if it was acceptable for bodies such as unions to try and persuade staff to take a certain viewpoint on matters, uh, then it was acceptable for the organisation and its communicators as well. Uh, training in internal communications among those I talked to was sporadic. Um, only half of them had any. Where it had been undertaken, it hadn't included any teaching in ethics. Uh, half of the participants were members of a representative body, uh, which was the CIPR. This has a code of ethics that's implicitly agreed to by joining. Uh, none of the participants, even those that were members, had read it. Uh, they indicated that they hadn't thought about doing so or just didn't think it would be useful to them. Uh, rather than using a code of conduct or decision-making framework to find their way out of ethical dilemmas, all participants, even those in the more senior roles, said that they would approach their line manager for help if they got into difficulties. They indicated that this is due to the intensely hierarchical structure of HMRC rather than any innate belief in their abilities. Uh, interestingly, those who said those who were line managers themselves and following the chain of logic would be expected to deal with approaches from staff said they would not feel well equipped um, to deal with the problems. Um, I found ethical decisions were being made individually through groups of co-workers or through the chain of command. Um, they were mostly being made on the basis of honest and dishonest or right and wrong. Um, honest and dishonest was an interesting one because it didn't actually mean truthful. <laughs> um, the, the, the level of honesty within the organisation and within the messages um, that it was sending out was very much constrained um, by the organisation picking which information to share and which to hold back. So communicators believe very, very strongly that it was absolutely wrong to lie to staff. Um, but by the same token, they said um, that it was absolutely right and completely ethical that the organisation not tell them everything, uh, even if that meant leaving out the key information. Um, right and wrong uh, was seen as being a clear and obvious choice, um, but some participants did point out the danger of this, um, that they, what they may think is right or wrong may be completely different to someone else. Um, I argued that the lack of standardised training, code of conduct or any other form of guidance or framework made it highly likely that communicators were making ethical decisions based on individual morals rather than universal ethics. Uh, I theorised this could provide an inconsistent service, undermining the credibility of internal communications within HMRC as a whole and potentially damaging it in the eyes of staff and in the eyes of management as well. Um, obviously, there are implications around training and potential codes of conduct for communicators in HMRC. I also think this research potentially has wider uh, implications for internal communications as a whole. Um, I think we need to assess uh, whether the lack of consideration of ethics is case-specific, specific to HMRC, or as I suspect, um, has a wider scale and the implications of this answer. Um, what I would love to be able to do would be to mirror the research on a wider scale, looking at both private and public sector organisations to see if the findings differ. I think another area ripe for research is around codes of conduct. Um, obviously, there is a debate around their usefulness in general, uh, with an argument that unless they are rigorously enforced, they're nothing but paper exercises. But on the flip side of the coin, they're also seen as being crucial to emerging professions uh, that must establish their own standards and goals, and what is IC if not an emerging profession. Um, as previously mentioned, most of those codes of conduct currently available are structured more around PR practitioners and expanded to cover communicators' work. I think we need to debate whether these are sufficient or whether internal communications wishes to establish its own code reflecting its own values. Thank you. <laughs>